My name is David Geeney. Uh, I'm a retired psychiatrist from Oxford and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Dr Gillian Pepper, who is a behavioural scientist in the Department of Psychology at Northumbria University. And she's collaborated amongst others with Daniel Nettle up in, in Newcastle. Um, she investigates socioeconomic inequalities and the effects upon psychology, behavior, health and well-being from an evolutionary perspective. And she's going to be talking to us today about the effect of perceived uncontrollable mortality risk upon health behavior and perhaps may touch on how this may exacerbate uh, underlying socioeconomic inequalities. So, uh, Gillian, uh, over to you then. Thank you very much, David, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today and talk about what uh, honestly is a sort of pet subject of mine. So uh, I'll enjoy hearing your thoughts on it and your questions. Uh, just to check, I'm hoping that you can see all the first slide of my talk right now. Yes, 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 we can. Uh, yes, fine. Yeah. Perfect, I shall proceed then. Um, so before I um, give the talk, I like to give a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going with things. I think it's always nice to know the direction that things are going in. Um, and so for today, uh, what I'm going to do is actually to uh, begin at the end slightly by telling you, broadly speaking, the conclusion of, of the work in a, in a very intuitive way, at least, that I've been doing. Um, and then we're going to go for a little bit of a walk along the evolutionary uh, path that led me to that conclusion. I'm going to try and summarize some of the evidence that I have so far. And talk about why it matters. So what the importance of uh, both the evolutionary theory and the evidence is for uh, bridging health inequalities, particularly. Um, hopefully, I will also have time to talk to you a little bit about future directions. Um, but as I promised, I'm going to start at the end somewhat. Um, and the reason for that is I think it's good to hold in mind the kind of intuitive logic of what I'm going to talk about while I try, try to explain the sort of slightly more uh, torturous path that is the evolutionary theory. Um, so uh, this is actually a quote from my PhD student, Richard Brown, who wrote this just a couple of weeks ago. But I think it really nicely encapsulates the, the conclusion of the research. And it is, if you believed that you were likely to be a victim of a stabbing before the age of 30, would eating your five a day, that is fruit and vegetables, seem very important? Now, this sounds rather overdramatic to the majority of people who are likely to be attending this talk, I would think. Um, but I want you just to hold this idea in your mind and to be reminded that actually the world is not necessarily a very safe place for everyone. OK, so we are. Often, uh, if you do feel 100% uh, safe all of the time, we're actually really very fortunate. Um, so I just want to uh, bring to the forefront of your mind some of the threats that exist in the world and that um, some people may be more exposed to than others. In no particular order, you may live near a volcano that is constantly erupting. This is actually Mount Etna. You may live in a place that's particularly prone to lightning strikes, believe it or not. Some states in the US, for example, are more prone than others to being struck by lightning. You may live in a place prone to flooding. This is actually uh, here in the UK, in the Lake District. Or a place where uh, accidents are very common, uh, motor vehicle accidents, perhaps. You might live in an environment with a lot of poisonous snakes, scorpions, spiders, or, or predators, indeed. Um, you may live somewhere prone to tsunamis or to earthquakes. You might, if you're unlucky, uh, live in a place with flammable cladding. So people here in the UK will be very familiar with the, uh, the Grenfell issue and will, will be aware that there are now a lot of people in the country who are living in uh, properties which not only have lost all their value, but are not really deemed safe. Um, and that, that for those people is, um, in a lot of cases, something that's really beyond their personal control at this time. You might be unlucky enough to live in a war zone, in which case the uh, threat of conflict is constant or in a place where um, you're exposed to a lot of forest fires, violent crime, or perhaps disease in the workplace. OK, so COVID-19 is in the forefront of a lot of our minds. And there are certainly some people who, through occupation, 
or living situation may be more exposed than others to the risk of such infectious diseases. Now, this is just a sample of risks that we can think about. And I wanted to flag them up because honestly, often when I give this kind of talk to people, it is to people who are relatively fortunate in that they are affluent and educated and rather much in control of where they live and what they're exposed to. But I want you to remember that that's not the case for everybody in the world. Um, and that that is kind of the crux of the talk that I'm going to go on uh, to give. The other thing that I want to remind you of is that because dangers such as some of these, uh, for example, venomous snakes, uh, volcanoes and tsunamis have been present in our evolutionary past and for some uh, length of time, we're also evolutionarily attuned to detect danger. Um, and I'm willing to bet that when I changed this slide, one of the first things that you noticed was the snake. Despite the fact that the snake is really quite well camouflaged, and there's some interesting uh, papers, I've given an example here, about why it should be that we should be able to very rapidly detect uh, animate objects in our environment and the evolutionary pressures for that. So risk is all around us to varying degrees, depending on who you are. And it's something that we're all quite attuned to in terms of our psychology. But why does this matter in terms of uh, health inequalities? So socioeconomic inequalities in health are something which are not unique to the UK. They're in fact ubiquitous in the world. Um, but I've taken an example here from the UK, which is just showing that um, if you go from the most deprived to the least deprived neighborhoods in the UK, you can see a steady increase in not only the life expectancy that you can expect to have, but also your healthy life expectancy. Okay, so there is this gap in both health and mortality depending on where you live, and in this case, how that relates to economic deprivation. And depending on where you look in the literature, there are varying estimates as to the extent to which this gap is due to individual behavior. And the, uh, on average, these estimates say that about 50% of this life expectancy gap is due to differences by socioeconomic status and health behavior. And I like to use this, uh, this photograph, uh, apologies to anyone who's seen this in a previous talk, um, to illustrate the point of the key health behaviors because I think there are some important things to draw out. So in the US in the year 2000, a study by Mokdad and colleagues demonstrated that the leading cause of death was tobacco use at 435,000 deaths or 18% of mortality in the US that year. After that, it was diet and physical inactivity. So poor diet and physical inactivity accounting for 400,000 or 17% of deaths. And after that, it was alcohol consumption, a further 85,000 deaths that year. Now, these key behaviors are responsible for an awful lot of that mortality gap that we see, about half, uh, slightly more, depending on your estimate. But it's also a public health puzzle, okay, a conundrum, because uh, it's often been wondered why it is that the people who are already poorest off, who, who struggle with more challenges in society, should also be the people who disproportionately display these behaviours which are worsening their situation. Secondary to that, you cannot necessarily argue that it's poverty itself that is causing these behaviours, because if we look at tobacco and alcohol consumption particularly, these are habits which cost money. Okay? So you actually actively have to pay to do these things and they're worsening your situation when you're already very poorly off. So a deeper explanation is needed to really understand these things. And this is where I think a little bit of evolutionary thinking can help. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you first about um, the evolutionary theory of aging and then about a model by Daniel Nettle that was inspired by that evolutionary theory of aging. And I'll draw out some of the differences between the two. Now, many of you may be um, familiar with disposable soma theory of the evolution of aging. So I'm just going to give you the broad brush strokes in, for those who are not familiar. Disposable theory, uh, disposable soma theory of aging uh, posits that organisms need to allocate um, energetic resources optimally between three key things. The first being growth and when that growth period is over, the others being reproduction and somatic maintenance, so uh, cellular and bodily repair. And according to this theory, if we make the assumption that somatic uh, effort is traded off against reproduction, so energy that I invest in repairing my cells cannot be invested in reproduction and vice versa. And we also make an assumption that there is this 
outside force, which is extrinsic mortality. And that is death that cannot be prevented due to somatic investment. So I find it easy to think about things like predation uh, and natural disaster. Okay, so these are things that no matter how much I repair myself, I cannot necessarily affect with that cellular repair. Okay, so that's extrinsic uh, mortality. And assuming that there is some level of extrinsic mortality, then it can mean that somatic investment is wasted because it's not being spent on reproduction. Okay? And the higher the rate of extrinsic mortality, the more you're wasting your efforts by repairing your, um, your body when you could be putting that effort into reproduction. And it's important to remember, of course, that uh, the number of descendants we leave is, is really the, the currency of natural selection. Okay? So um, selection uh, for perfect repair is therefore unlikely, evolutionarily speaking, and we get the evolution of aging. So that's just a sort of cartoon outline of the theory, um, but this is a theory that is used to explain why aging might evolve across generations as a trait in species. What uh, Daniel Nettle did was he, he made this uh, behavioral ecological model in which he took that logic of investment in the self being wasted in high extrinsic mortality risk environments, and he applied it to health behavior rather than physiological repair. And what he did was he assumed a certain amount of phenotypic flexibility. So flexibility within an individual's lifetime rather than evolution over generations, which assumes that we're taking in, in information about our environment. So cues from our environment about things like extrinsic mortality and using that information to optimize our investment in certain behaviors. In his models, he specifies a level of trade-off between investing in health and other things that en enhance fitness. Now, when I say fitness here, what I mean is Darwinian fitness, not physical fitness. And importantly, in this model, what he does is he makes this definition, this behavioral definition of intrinsic and extrinsic. So it's no longer about physiological repair, it's about behavior. And what that means is it's about how much your behavior can affect your risk of death. So he parceled out these two things into intrinsic and extrinsic, where intrinsic or controllable risks are those risks that you can reduce by altering your behavior, such as those classic health behaviors I showed you on the earlier slide, things like physical activity, diet, alcohol consumption, and even some simple safety behaviors such as seatbelt use. But then we've got the extrinsic or the uncontrollable category of risk. And those are more things that regardless of what you do, you may be unable to avoid them. And this is particularly true if you are lower uh, socioeconomic status, so if you have limited income or lim limited education, for example. So these things can include things like exposure to hazards at work or at home. It can be that flammable cladding that I mentioned earlier. It can be pollution or violent crime in your neighborhoods. And for some people who are much poorer, it's going to be very difficult to move to a better neighborhood to avoid these problems. Okay, so they are less controllable for some people. Now, admittedly, there will be a, a spectrum of controllability. There's not really this distinction between extrinsic and intrinsic, but it's useful to make this distinction for modeling purposes. You'll also note that I'm going to switch throughout this talk between using the terms extrinsic and intrinsic and using the terms controllable and uncontrollable. I'm actually doing this because I believe that Daniel's model is something very different to the original evolutionary theory for all the reasons I mentioned on the previous slide. And I like to try and draw that distinction by using different terms, because I think when we use extrinsic and intrinsic in those people who are very familiar with the evolutionary models, it triggers a slightly different idea and can cause some misunderstandings. So when I talk about my behavioral research, I try to use the terms controllable and uncontrollable. You may sometimes hear me slip there. So here are the main conclusions of uh, Daniel's model. First, uh, on the left here in panel A, what you can see is that he's plotted uh, a fairly low absolute uh, level of extrinsic mortality, up to 5%. And he's plotted that against what would be the optimal health behavior for different levels of trade-off. So these are just different strengths of trade-off in the different symbols and lines that you see here. And the main thing to note is that for any given strength of trade-off, we have a decrease in the optimal health behavior that a person ought to perform as extrinsic mortality risk increases. And this is um, obviously uh, results in a much lower investment in health when the trade-off is also strong. 
Okay, so extrinsic mortality risk has an effect, as does the trade-off. And I'd like to just as a side note point out that when we're thinking about socioeconomic uh, differences, it's important to think that the trade-offs might also be steeper. So if you have less money, or perhaps if you have less time because you're working more than one job in order to earn the money you need to survive, you may experience a steeper trade-off between doing that work, for example, and investing your, own, your time or money in other things like physical activity. But one of the conclusions of this, this decrease uh, that we see in optimal health behavior with extrinsic mortality risk increasing is that we may see an exacerbatory effect, which is what is illustrated in this slide on the right. So what that means is that we first have this primary effect of extrinsic mortality risk on your total mortality. So this is just the effect of extrinsic mortality risk on its own. But then assuming that we have this uh, disincentive to behave healthily at higher extrinsic mortality, what that does is that creates unhealthy behavior, which then exacerbates the effect, giving you an overall greater risk um, of uh, mortality. So this is sort of the behaviorally driven bit in between the wedge here. And so hopefully I've now convinced you that there is a theoretical reason to expect that we might reduce our efforts uh, towards health behavior if we've got this sort of perception of uncontrollable risk. And now what I want to do is just to point out that people of lower socioeconomic status are disproportionately exposed to a whole range of risks that might be considered uncontrollable. Um, these include things like uh, air pollution, uh, lead, tobacco smoke, inadequate and unsafe housing and residential conditions, unsafe working conditions, which are greater if you're a manual laborer, which by definition would make you lower occupational class. And one of the most striking ones, actually, I've, I've cited all the sources in the bottom here, but one of the most striking ones to me is a paper by Shore and colleagues in 2005 on violence, which showed that people in the poorest 10% of neighborhoods in the UK have a five-fold greater risk of being a victim of violence than people in the wealthiest 10%, which for me is really quite striking. And of course, more recently, uh, we've seen an impact of COVID-19. Uh, now, this is actually from very early on in the pandemic, the slide that you can see here. But what it shows is that we see uh, in people in the most deprived uh, neighborhoods in the UK, a disproportionate uh, number of deaths related to COVID-19. So we know that there are a whole uh, range of factors that might be affecting people and increasing their perception of extrinsic or uncontrollable mortality and disincentivizing their health behavior. But one of the things obviously that we need is to have some evidence of that. And so uh, I'm gonna talk you through some of the, the evidence that I've collected. Uh, the first was a piece of observational or sort of correlational evidence. And what I did was I needed to devise a measure for this concept of, of control over mortality risk or of extrinsic or uncontrollable mortality risk. And I adapted a, a phrase that's been used in, in previous studies, like the health and retirement study. And I asked, if you made the maximum effort that you could to look after your health and ensure your safety, what do you think the chances would be that you would live to be 75 or more, where zero is no chance and 100 is certain certainty to live beyond that age? Now, bear in mind, I've used the age 75 here because that was actually the wording of the original question, which didn't ask about maximum effort, but just general perception of living that long. And this is the threshold below which uh, a death is considered premature, the age of 75. Um, I also ask people if you made no effort at all to look after your health and safety and um, what do you think the chances would be that you would live to be 75 or more again from, from zero to, to 100. Now, um, previous studies have shown that responses to questions of this type do in fact behave like probabilities and tend to correlate uh, with meaningful things such as socioeconomic status. Um, and you can imagine that we have this axis then of odds of survival or, or odds of premature death, depending on which way around you want to look at it. And you may have total certainty that you're going to survive uh, beyond the age of 75, or you may have something below that. And you're, certainly your maximum effort ceiling could be some portion beneath 100% certainty. And the difference between 100% and maximum effort tells us what is the portion of your survival odds that you feel unable to affect with your behavior. Okay, so no matter what you do, there is some degree to which you feel you can't necessarily ensure your survival beyond 75. Similarly, with minimum effort, this gap between minimum and maximum 
tells us the proportion of our overall mortality risk that we uh, can affect or that we believe we can affect with our behavior. Okay, and that's the perceived controllable mortality risk portion. So what I did was I took this measure and surveyed uh, 600 people in America via a company called Social Sci. And what we found, broadly speaking, is that those people who were lower SES in this group also felt that they had less control over what might kill them. Secondly, they reported making less effort to look after their health. And this association between SES and effort invested in health, so just self-reported, was completely statistically accounted for or mediated by the perception of uncontrollable mortality risk. And just to drive home the scale of the effect that I'm talking about, I like to visualize this uh, in the, the diameter of a circle. So imagine we have our model. It contains income and socioeconomic status, age and gender, but also perceived uncontrollable and controllable mortality risk, all of these things together to predict health behavior. And in this model, the effect sizes that we get out look something like this. It's a tiny little effect of age where that, uh, the diameter of that circle is a partial liter squared. A slightly larger but still small effect of sex. No effect of either SES or income is actually visible in this model once we've got perceived uncontrollable mortality risk in the model. Perceived controllable mortality has a somewhat bigger effect and perceived uncontrollable mortality had such a big effect in this particular model that we cannot even fit the size of that on the screen. And this is just to give you the idea of the extent to which in this correlational study, this seems to be important. But this is only a correlational study, okay? Correlation does not imply causation. Um, and certainly um, we didn't measure any actual health behavior. We, we just measured self-reported health behavior. So I wanted to follow up on this with some experiments. And what I did was I used a cover story of something that was big news at the time, which was the Public Health England's Longer Lives website had been released and had shown these kind of large disparities by area in terms of life expectancy. And I said to my participants in my experiment that I was going to try and find out what was driving this difference. And I asked people to give their age and their gender and their postcode. And I told them that this was being matched to some information in a database. Of course, this was not. This is a randomly allocated experiment. Uh, and people were fully debriefed afterwards uh, for ethical purposes. But for a short while, they thought they were being given information matched for people like them, people of their age and gender from uh, their postcode. And what they got was a prime that was either an uncontrollable or a controllable risk prime that looked like this. OK, so this is the uncontrollable example. It says statistics indicate that on average, blank year old blanks, so imagine your age and gender inserted there, in your postcode area, imagine your postcode in the brackets there, die 13 years younger than blanks of the same age in the rest of the UK. The reasons for this are unclear and may be due to factors beyond individual control, such as traffic accidents and air pollution. And we want to understand more about why this is happening, so please answer the following questions about your health. So, this was the uncontrollable example. We also randomized a controllable one where people were living 13 years longer. We asked people to fill out some questions about their intended health behavior in the future. And then here's the big thing, okay? We, we offered them a prize for taking part in the study, which could either be a box of Thornton's chocolates, our unhealthy option, or a box of organic fruit, our healthy option. Now, these are both worth 11 pounds to try and uh, rule out the fact that somebody might just choose the more expensive item. And here's what we found, okay? In the condition where people were made to feel that it was controllable factors that were affecting uh, the length of life, so we just said health behavior, we see a increase, in fact, almost a doubling here in the number of people who are choosing fruit rather than chocolate. However, this was just an initial pilot experiment, and I had been keen to make sure that we could see some kind of difference in people's behavior. And so what I'd done is I'd put in the more extreme conditions. I've got uncontrollable short life and controllable long life. And of course, you may have already thought, well, that confounds two factors. We don't know if it's the length of life that might be causing this effect or the, or the controllability of the factors mentioned. So I repeated the experiment, but this time teasing apart the controllability from the length of life in the primes, 
and also adding a control condition to get at the idea of uh, what would be the baseline preference for fruit amongst the group. And this is what we find. We find indeed that um, there is an effect of controllability versus uncontrollability. So first, let's look at the control condition here on the left. We see that the baseline preference for fruit is just slightly higher than half um, rather than chocolate. Um, it's actually about 50-50 preference for fruit and chocolate in the uncontrollable condition. But we get this big increase uh, in preference for fruit in both the controllable long life and the controllable short life primes. And what that's telling us really is that it's the controllability that matters rather than the perceived length of life in the prime. And this was all well and good, but I was actually keen to make sure that there weren't demand effects. Okay, so people who took part in this study knew they were taking part in a study. Um, and it was very obvious uh, that it was about health behavior. And they might have sort of rumbled me and tried to select the fruit or chocolate in some way that they deemed that I would want them to do. Okay. So what I did was I did a more surreptitious experiment. I went to the Gateshead Metro Center, uh, which is here in the Northeast. And I stood for about five days and talked to a couple of hundred different people to encourage them to take part in a prize draw. Um, um, people didn't necessarily know that this was an experiment. What they did know was that they had to answer some questions and those questions were like primes. So in the uh, con uncontrollable condition, uh, people, and these were just randomized, which card they got, uh, people were asked this, the following question. Recent statistics show that people in Tyne and Weir are living longer now than they were in the year 2000. Why do you think this is? Is it A, because there are fewer traffic accidents, B, because there's less violent crime, or C, both? In the controllable condition, it was the same thing. People are living longer. Why do you think this is? Um, and the options were because people have more control over the kind of health care they receive. So I even used the words control in there. Because people are looking after themselves better or both. So those are controllable prime. Now, um, I also asked people to fill out their age and gender and address on the back of the card. Um, and I used the addresses to send them their prizes, but also to look up uh, indices of multiple deprivation, which give us an idea of their socioeconomic status based on their area of residence. I then asked people, surprise, surprise, to post their card into a box, depending on whether they would prefer to have fruit or chocolate as a prize. And I looked at what they did. And what I found in this one was that there was indeed a small increase, although smaller than in the previous studies, in preference for fruit um, when there was the controllable long life prime present. Um, You'll also notice there's a much lower baseline preference for fruit over chocolate here. And I actually think this might be driven by a couple of things. So working in the real world with these studies is rather messy. And uh, you might just about be able to see the Christmas lights hanging in the background of this picture here. But it was actually the end of November when I ca carried out this study. So a little early for Christmas shopping in my book, but for some people not so. And a lot of people did say to me when they uh, posted their card into this box to get chocolate that they thought that would make a better Christmas gift for someone which of course is going to distort any effect because they're not thinking about eating the food themselves. Secondly, uh, and I know this partly because um, I had the indices of multiple deprivation for people's addresses, I was standing in the interchange here, which was for the uh, local public transport. So people who were coming into this area where I was stationed were coming in on trains and buses, as opposed to from the other end of the shopping center where people come from the car park. And actually what that meant was I had a much uh, lower SES sample in this study than in the previous ones. And that may, in, to some extent, have affected this baseline preference for chocolate. But anyway, this, these three experiments combined give me some uh, confidence that perhaps there's some causal link between your perception of controllability uh, over your mortality risk and your, your likelihood of investing in healthy behaviors. And some of you might be wondering, well, what is the implication of all of this uh, for the pandemic? Has that had an effect? Um, and so now I'm going to tell you about a project which was run by uh, Richard Brown, my PhD student, uh, during uh, COVID-19 lockdown in the first wave here in the UK. He ran a nationally representative uh, survey by a company called Prolific um, on the 6th and 7th of May, so during the strictest part of the first uh, UK lockdown. 
After some quality checks for consistency of responses between platforms, we ended up with around 500 people. And what Richard did was he measured perceived uncontrollable mortality risk, both with and without the effects of the pandemic. Unfortunately, we did not have the foresight to survey people before uh, everyone went into lockdown, so we couldn't look at actual change due to the pandemic. But what we could do was to ask people to take the measures, holding in their mind the effects of the pandemic in one case and not in the other. We also then asked them to give a self-reported adherence to a range of government guidelines, both on COVID prevention behaviours and also on general health behaviour. So the preventative advice around COVID-19 at the time was to only go outside of your home for food, health reasons or work, but only if you cannot work from home. If you do go outside your home, stay two metres away from other people at all times. Do not go outside your home to meet others, even friends or family. Uh, wash your hands with soap and water often, making sure to do this for at least 20 seconds. Cover your mouth um, and nose with a tissue if you sneeze or cough. And also to not touch your eyes, nose or mouth if your hands are not clean. Now you'll notice this is before uh, mask wearing became a key piece of advice, uh, but this was the official government uh, prevent COVID-19 prevention advice at the time. We also asked for their um, people's self-reported adherence to a range of general health advice. We asked about how often they got their five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. We asked uh, how often they adhered to the advice to not drink more than 14 uh, units of alcohol in a week. And we also asked them whether or not they were getting the recommended levels of physical activity and whether or not they were refraining from smoking. We measured a couple of other risk perception variables other than the perceived extrinsic or uncontrollable mortality risk. Uh, those included concern about spreading infection to others, uh, the perceived risk of being infected oneself, and the perceived threat to life um, from COVID-19 should you become infected. We did find that there was a significant difference between people's uncontrollable and control, um, uncontrollable mortality risk taking into account the pandemic and not. Okay, so a significant difference between when you're uh, thinking about the pandemic and when you're thinking that trying to pretend the pandemic doesn't exist, which I appreciate is not ideal, but it was the best we could do. And what we found here was um, almost a 5% increase in perceived uncontrollable risk, which on the face of it sounds quite small, actually. You think, oh, okay, you know, big global pandemic, only 5% increase in perceived uncontrollable risk. But actually, if we just briefly go back to Daniel's original model, these models, uh, this model here is actually for a low level of extrinsic mortality risk, okay, up to 5%. And we still see really quite meaningful, potentially very impactful effects from that low level of absolute extrinsic mortality risk. So actually, potentially 5% increase could have quite an impact on health behavior. But what did we find with the data? So first things first, let's talk about compliance with COVID-19 advice. Uh, one thing to note, which I think was rather comforting, uh, even though this is only self-reported adherence, is that self-reported adherence to uh, compliance uh, with these guidelines was generally very high. Okay, So the majority of people said that they were always or almost always complying with things. There's a bit more variability here around not touching the eyes, nose or mouth, which I think we can all understand. I think that's somewhat of an automatic behavior. It's very much harder. Uh, to avoid doing. We found that perceived uncontrolled mortality risk was not a predictor of any of these measures, okay, which actually we sort of expected because this is an unusual situation. It's not um, health behavior that only affects you. There's also the effect that it has on others and the spread of the disease, which makes it a little bit different to something like your diet. Um, but we were still interested to see whether it would have an effect, and it doesn't. What does have an effect is being male. So men, uh, self-reported, of course, uh, said that they were significantly less likely to adhere to these hygiene behaviours. So washing hands for 20 seconds or more, covering the mouth when coughing and not touching your face. We also found that perceived threat to life uh, increased compliance with all precautions. So people who thought that catching COVID-19 was likely to be fatal were much more likely to ad uh, adhere to advice. And concern about spreading infection uh, was predictive of some things such as staying home, hand washing and covering the mouth. And what about general health advice? 
So what we see here is much, much more variable compliance in general. So unlike the, um, the COVID-19 prevention behaviors where we see generally very high compliance, here it's very varied, okay? So uh, for example, with diet, we get a sort of full rainbow effect here of people um, complying mostly somewhere in between always and never. We do see uh, something quite predictable with smoking which is that it's the least variable, um, which doesn't surprise me at all. You're either a smoker or you're not. Um, and we see a proportion of people reporting some smoking that are roughly, is roughly in line with the amount that you'd expect uh, based on um, data that we have about the proportion of smokers in the population. But here gets the interesting part. So firstly, compliance with government diet advice was indeed associated with perception of uncontrollable risk. Um, here are just the odds ratios. And what you can see here is that it's really, it's much higher um, perceived uncontrollable mortality risk at the end where people are not complying. Whereas people who always comply with this dietary advice have much lower perceived uncontrollable risk. I just want to remind you all that because we don't have longitudinal data, we can't necessarily say that any difference in, we can't say that there's any difference in this behavior due to the pandemic. We can only say that there's been an increase in perception of an uncontrollable mortality risk and that that is associated with this behavior. Unfortunately, we don't have longitudinal data. So when it comes to physical activity, we also see a significant effect and there are your odds ratios, um, which is quite strongly driven by this dramatically sort of higher uh, level of perceived extrinsic mortality risk amongst these people who never do. <laughs> anything uh, to, to comply with the physical activity guidelines. We also see that um, there is uh, a greater likelihood of doing some smoking amongst people who have higher perceived uncontrollable risk. Um, and that's, uh, I've broken them down in just to never smoking and some smoking here, but you can also see that if you look at the full spectrum too. Interestingly, there was no association of perceived uncontrollable mortality risk with uh, adherence to the alcohol guidelines. Um, and that's actually uh, fascinating for me for a couple of reasons. And one is actually that we don't tend to see the SES difference in our alcohol consumption when we just look at mean consumption of alcohol levels. Where we see an SES difference is in the harm that people experience associated with alcohol consumption. And so that's, that's an interesting thought for me, but we can come back to that later potentially. So why am I telling you about all of this theory and all of this evidence that I've got? Um, and I think the most important thing is it has some interesting and important implications for health inequalities. So the first thing is the thing that was illustrated in the slide with Daniel's model is this idea that there could be a twofold effect. Okay, so that perhaps if we were to tackle those sources of mortality that are perceived as uncontrollable to people, we might see a spontaneous improvement in health behavior. And that would be a twofold benefit, right? Because we're already tackling something that is affecting people's uh, health and life expectancy. And in addition, perhaps seeing secondary benefits to that in that people might spontaneously take better care of themselves. It's also very important to me to note that this can imply that unhealthy behavior may be a logical response to one's ecology. So I think it's often treated as whim or ignorance. People say, oh, well, they don't take better care of themselves because they don't know any better. They need to be educated. Or perhaps just because they don't care and we don't know why. Um, but I think this tells us that there can be strong drivers in your ecology that drive your motivation to take care of yourself. I think it can help us to understand a little bit why uh, public health interventions may widen inequalities. So for example, uh, to give an example of an intervention, um, it's known that when uh, say cancer screening, free cancer screening is offered to people, it's often the worried wealthy well who preferentially take up that screening um, and not people who potentially really need it, who are at a greater risk. Um, and so we can see this widening of inequality because people are less motivated, even when it's free screening, to take that up. And admittedly, there may be barriers like transport cost and time off work, but certainly we do see that it tends to be uh, the worried wealthy well who take these things up and thereby benefit from them, which actually widens inequalities, even though the um, intervention is well-meaning. There's also this possibility that uh, risk perception might be skewed. So we live in a world of mass media where we're constantly talking about, for example, COVID-19 or terrorist attacks or um, natural disasters. 
And perhaps exposure to all of that can lead people to overestimate their risk of death due to certain causes, which might uh, skew our perceived risk. And if that is true, then what we can do is adjust perceptions and that may lead to healthier behavior. Equally, if it's untrue, then it might be considered unethical to try and adjust people's perceptions and we may need to actually really do something to tackle the risk. There are some more practical uh, implications that come out of the data that I showed you on the COVID-19 pandemic. One of them being that our findings showed that perceived threat to life from COVID-19 increased compliance with uh, COVID-19 prevention advice. And in isolation, that finding might lead you to believe that it's a good idea to make people afraid, that it's a good idea to highlight the threat from the disease to make sure that people comply. But actually what that might do, according to the rest of our data, is to increase perceived uncontrollable mortality risk and have this unintended consequence of reducing other um, otherwise healthy behaviours, such as eating your five a day or going running. And before I move on to, uh, to wrap things up and to talk about um, a little bit about future directions, I want to just make one more point about how evolutionary thinking has informed this idea. And I think it's a really useful distinction um, that I use a lot. And I, I would like to encourage other people to think about too. Now, apologies if you're already familiar with the ultimate proximate distinction. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through it for anybody who is not. So the ultimate proximate distinction is about separating explanations for phenomena based on whether or not they are an adaptationist, uh, an ultimate and evolutionary explanation, or whether they're a mechanistic or approximate explanation. And the way I like to think of it as the ultimate explanation is the why. Why should we see a given behavior in a given context? And the proximate explanation is about the how that behavior is delivered, the mechanisms behind it. And to give an example, I like to take this table from uh, Scott Phillips and colleagues uh, who wrote a wonderful paper on this particular distinction and how, uh, how useful it is in, in clear theoretical thinking. And what they did was, um, I like this explanation of the infant crying best, um, and they separated out reasons why an infant might cry. Okay, so the ultimate or the adaptive reason that an infant might cry is that it elicits um, defensiveness from caregivers. Okay, so um, that will thereby increase the infant's likelihood of survival and will have inclusive fitness benefits. Okay, so that's the reason why infants in general should cry. But the proximate explanations can be a range of things that are the mechanisms or the triggers that deliver the crying. Okay, and these can be being cold, being hungry, being separated from your caregiver. We can even talk about physiological mechanisms. We could talk about a flood of endogenous opioids, for example. But none of these things are the reason that infants in general cry. They are the ways by which the crying is delivered. Okay, they are the, they are the mechanism underlying the crying and the triggers. And so by making this distinction, what we can do is we can think a little bit more clearly about different types of explanation that are in the literature, what's competing and what's complementary. And what you find with this mode of thinking is that a lot of uh, explanations that are typically pitted against one, uh, one another are actually not mutually exclusive. Um, I've, and so one of the reasons that I wanted to point all this out to you is I frequently have this kind of conversation, okay? So, I've, I've given people all this explanation that I've just given you now, and people say, oh, but surely people with lower SES are just stressed and they're self-medicating with alcohol or cake. And my answer is always something a bit like this, okay? It's yes, that could be true, but stress is more of a proximate mechanism, okay? It doesn't tell us why people uh, should invest less or, uh, or show less healthy behavior in the face of these kinds of circumstances, okay? For that, we need an ultimate explanation, the why do it, okay? And I've actually got a book chapter where I explain this perhaps more clearly than I've explained it now, um, where I take uh, nine different categories of explanation for socioeconomic differences in health behavior, um, which were created by Pample and colleagues in the Annual Review of Sociology. And what they did was they went through the literature and they looked at all these different categories of explanation and they did somewhat try and pit them against one another in terms of what evidence is available for them. But actually I would argue that a lot of these things can be happening all at once and that we need to think a little bit differently about uh, how we categorize them. 
So I actually recategorize those explanations. I don't want you to worry too much about what the explanations are, but essentially there's a bunch of explanations that are really proximate. They're more about mechanisms that either deliver or exacerbate differences in behavior. And then some of them are ultimate. So the why, the why is, why would we see lower SES people performing less health behavior in general? And that's the fewer benefits of health behavior category. There are also some constraint-based explanations. So outside of this proximate ultimate distinction, we do actually just have general constraints, okay? So you may not perform a healthier behavior if you just genuinely have no knowledge of what's good for you. And you also may not if you're just unable to, if you cannot afford it, okay? So that's the aids to healthy behavior explanation. But in general, I find that this way of thinking about ultimate and proximate is really useful to make distinctions. So not to labor on that too much further, um, I would like to just talk very briefly about some of the things that I am planning on working on in the future around this area. So my PhD student, Richard Brown, is currently working on trying to find out what types of risk are commonly perceived as being controllable by people and which are not. We're also trying to find a way to assess the accuracy of people's risk perception, which is actually no small task because Identifying what people's uh, objective risk levels are and the extent to which they could modify them with behavior is a pretty tough challenge, actually. Um, but if we can do that, then we can start to get at this question of whether or not people's uh, personal perceptions of risk are skewed. And if they are skewed, how we can shift them. So whether or not we can actually give people information that changes their behavior by changing their perception of risk. And in line with that, whether or not we can uh, instigate public health interventions uh, that increase people's safety and thereby improve health behavior. And this is a final question that I'm, I'm actually working on and have already worked on a bit. I have a paper on this um, if you're interested. But I have this idea that the effect of uncontrollable mortality risk or extrinsic mortality risk may not only be limited to health behavior. It may be that if you believe that you are likely to die young due to something you can do nothing about, you might be far more likely to discount the future, to live in the present, to, to have short time horizons. And rather than uh, talk to you about the contents of my paper here, I'm actually going to show you some quotes from another paper by Brezina and colleagues called Might Not Be a Tomorrow. And this, um, these quotes come from interviews with youth offenders in the US who have very, very short time horizons and also who really genuinely believe that they could die any day. Okay. Gillian, uh, we, we, we've got just uh, 10 minutes left, I think, on our Zoom time. So uh, just to leave a little bit of time for questions, if you would. Well, that's good because I'm about to finish. <laughs> Before <laughs> moving to questions, I had one last thing to say, which is that if you would like to help my PhD student to raise some funds to do some of the work that I've just told you about, and if you are a user of Prolific, he actually currently has a, uh, a grant proposal up on the Prolific uh, competition board, which Prolific users can vote for. And you can do that using this link, which I will put in the chat. Um, but with that, I would like to move on to thank my collaborators, who are Daniel Nettle, my PhD student Richard Brown, my colleague Lynn Coventry, uh, and to ask you guys if you have any questions. Um, while we're waiting for other questions to come in, Gillian, could, could I perhaps uh, thank you uh, for how very clear your talk was? And um, I, I was wondering, uh, could you say anything about how what you're describing ties in, if you feel it does tie in, with uh, the differentiation between a fast and a slow life cycle? Absolutely. So I think this is why I, I, I think I, I had a moment where I blethered on about not using the terms extrinsic and intrinsic. So I've moved to trying to mention controllable and uncontrollable. And that is because Though this idea is closely related to models that are in life history theory, where we talk about fast and slow strategies, we have recently come uh, in the field to the understanding that really that it's overly simplistic to talk about a fast and a slow strategy. Um, there isn't necessarily such a thing. But 
that we need to have more specific models, like the model of Daniels that I've talked about, to make predictions about the circumstances under which we might see behaviors that look fast or slow, um, but to move away from that distinction uh, and those categories. And I could point you towards some fantastic talks by colleagues of mine, for example, Rebecca Sear, who gave a great talk as part of the Evolution and Human Behavior Association conference um, about this very uh, subject, about the sort of the danger of just loosely categorizing people as fast and slow. Um, so, yeah, I think that's something that obviously seems to come out of what I'm saying. <laughs> it seems to be very related, but it's also a little bit dangerous to just make that very loose association um, without thinking a little bit with a bit more specificity in your models, um, which is why I, where I get into trouble when I talk about time horizons. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So, so uh, it, it's it's a more nuanced approach than just a a, di a dichotomous approach that you, that you're advocating. Um, other questions, uh, Riyad, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you very much, Gillian. That was uh, really fascinating. Um, um, David has already um, uh, uh, raised the issue of the fast slow, which I was going to um, um, uh, to um, uh, to raise. Um, uh, um, but um, uh, the other thing that um, uh, um, I um, uh, note that you, you you haven't mentioned is the issue of mismatch uh, mm -hmm. and whether you think that is um, playing a role uh, here in the um, uh, in, um, in the increased mortality and um, um, uh, is it possible that um, that the, the stress of uncontrollability or the reduced autonomy that is inherent in having a low socioeconomic status, having, having, a, uh, 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 having a job that you, 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 you have little uh, uh, controllability or little autonomy uh, in, uh, or not having a job at all and having even less autonomy with regards to um, how you you uh, get your income and so forth? Could it be that there there is an uh, an inherent element there of um, of the effects of stress that has its um, uh, health consequences regardless of health behaviour? Absolutely, and that's one of the other things I've been studying, actually. So I've recently been writing up a paper where I've been uh, looking effectively at early life adversity and how that relates to biological aging uh, in younger adults, actually. And it's possible that some of that health impact, or maybe even a great deal of that health impact, is just due to the straight stress. Um, but what we get from, as I said earlier in my presentation, from the different estimates that you see in the public health literature is somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of this um, gradient is, approxim is approximated to be due to health behavior. Um, now, obviously, there is a, a margin of error for these things. And uh, <laughs> it depends on how you measure health behavior, how you measure stress. Um, sure. and how you measure socioeconomic status, and there are so many ways to do those things. Um, but I think, yes, there could also and, be a And, and where, where do you stand on the question of relative as opposed to absolute um, a sort of poverty and uh, disadvantage and things like that, where some, such as Robert Sapolsky, uh, say that it's the relative uh, disadvantage that matters, um, not the absolute disadvantage. Um, uh, and, you know, others have contradicted that. What, where, where do you stand on that? So um, I am actually still on the fence about that one. I think the, uh, the proof will be in the proverbial pudding. We need to test it more. Uh, certainly from a theoretical standpoint, as you say, uh, there are people like Robert Sapolsky arguing for the relative being very important. Um, my colleague Daniel, he has written an interesting book chapter that talks about theoretically why we might see the same result. We might see associations with something like inequality and um, health from actually um, an effect of absolute poverty. So Daniel believes that these, what looks like a, a relative effect can emerge from actually just an effect of absolute poverty. 
I am still not sure, and I think we need to test these things empirically to be certain, more so than we have done. There, there is plenty of nice evidence. So um, I have a colleague, Sandeep Mishra, who's done some really nice stuff looking at the uh, effect of experimentally priming inequality um, on what that does to uh, risk-taking behavior in the lab. Um, but I think there's just a lot more work to be done to really disentangle what's going on in the real world as opposed to in the lab. We've got uh, two or three questions. I don't know whether we'll be able to fit them in, but if I can ask that if the questions are, and the answers are succinct, we might succeed. Uh, Robert Davey. Is Robert Davey there ready? Maybe you're muted, Robert. No, uh, if, if yeah, Robert- Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's doing to talk. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Robert. Yes, uh, I'm interested in the idea uh, of healthy behaviour. Um, because there, there, there are many types of healthy behaviours, um, some of which may be more evolutionary behaviours, um, some of which like, may be more uh, eating, avoiding snakes and spiders and brightly coloured mushrooms. Avoiding snakes and Another spiders. Which are more recent, brightly coloured mushrooms. Such as speed of driving. Um, and being just on the internet, I guess. Um, that we have subject to uh, evolutionary uh, pressures. So I, I think it's probably important to distinguish those. And as far as the healthy, healthy life, healthy behaviours we've been talking about today: diet, smoking, and exercise. Um, I, I guess cultures have always had ideas about uh, diet and health, and over the years they've tended to be wrong or misled. Um, it's only recently that we've started to have a scientific understanding of different types of healthy diet and levels of exercise and e even then our understanding is very basic so um, for example the, the, the hypothesis that raised cholesterol levels is uh, is unhealthy and cholesterol needs to be reduced in order to promote health and prolong life there, there is quite a significant body of evidence that suggests that that's like many other health fads, nonsense. So I just wanted to make the point that we don't really know what a lot of healthy lifestyles are. Um, and we ought to get a better handle on that before we start deciding how we're going to promote healthy lifestyle styles and healthy choices. Well, thank you, Robert. You made two very big points there. Um, I will deal with the last one first. So I think you're right in the sense that we don't know necessarily as well as we could what is a healthy lifestyle and what you know the ideal amount of exercise is. Certainly if you do too much exercise, that's damaging. Um, I've been reading about overtraining uh, in, a, in a, a book by a colleague recently, and that has some, some really drastic effects on you. Um, but certainly um, the thing that is important, I think, with respect to the work that I'm doing is that it looks like the motivation to do whatever is societally agreed to be healthy is the thing that is being shifted. So the motivation to, you know, take the healthier option, um, even when you think perhaps the unhealthier option yeah. might be tastier, for example. So I think the the importance for this work is more understanding why people will be motivated to take care of their health or not as opposed to understanding what exactly is good for people, which is a whole other area mm. of research that yeah. potentially I yeah. don't have the uh, power to give you all the answers there. Yeah. And I'm really glad that you brought up the idea about evolutionarily novel risks. So one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently is that we are starting to look at, well, what types of risks are perceived as being controllable and not. And there are some risks that are novel, and therefore people don't behave in ways that you might expect of them. So you mentioned, um, things like driving. And in fact, it's one of the riskiest things that we all do day to day. 
yet the sense of being behind the wheel and the car responding to your touch and you being in control gives people potentially actually a sort of false level of sense of control over their, their risks when driving. Um, but it's also an evolutionarily novel thing. So we haven't really had time to adapt to our ability to do that and to the risks that are involved. Uh, similarly, I think a lot about air pollution. Okay, so air pollution is actually responsible for a good number of um, illnesses and possibly even premature deaths. And I think it's actually a bit of a problem because it's a thing we can't really see or touch. It's not very salient to us in our environment. I often wonder if we uh, put color into people's uh, petrol, <laughs> if we dyed it so that we could really see the fumes, whether that would have an effect on people. But certainly there are a whole range of these novel risks and uh, we don't know what people think about them in terms of their perception of controllability. And that's something we're gonna be looking into um, and keeping, uh, keeping in my mind as I investigate. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, David, you're talking, but you're on mute. You need to unmute, David. Yes, my apologies. Uh, Nikhil uh, has his hand up. If you're there, Nikhil, um, do you have a question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Okay, great. Um, just... Okay, I don't know whether you can see me, but thanks for that, Gillian. Uh, I really enjoyed that, and, and I really enjoyed following your work generally with uh, Daniel. My question, since I've been reading your work has always been, I know you alluded to it, but about proximate mechanism, because especially when it comes to the priming studies, it's just fascinating that, you know, a five minute exposure to a prime or whatever it may be, is enough to induce these shifts in behavior like with, with the chocolate or fruit. So firstly, I was wondering whether you could comment at all on any speculative proximate mechanisms, particularly when they're that acute and fast acting. And then the other aspect I wanted to get at with the proximate mechanism is that it seems like a lot of your studies are to do with perception of risk. And I was wondering how you think perception is sort of interacting with real risk um, and acting as a mechanism or, or the the uh, sort of stimulus for a mechanism rather than real risk. So excellent questions and thank you for that. Um, in terms of thinking about the mechanism of what happens in these kind of priming studies, um, I'm honestly currently not sure, but I think there might be something in motivation. So I, I have some unpublished data from a work that was done by a intercalating medical student and she did a fabulous job, but um, it's, it's somewhat incomplete data due to a technical fail. But what was indicated initially due to that data was that the primes that you saw earlier uh, that I talked about in one of my previous studies seem to shift behavior, but not liking for healthy food. So we actually, we got people to look at the similar kinds of primes to the ones I, I showed you earlier and uh, then rated their preference for a range of different foods, uh, some of which were very healthy and some of which were not. And there was absolutely no effect of the prime on how palatable the foods looked to the, these people. Um, but then we did see a hint of change in behavior when given a choice um, of a range of foods to, people actually had to go on to uh, the Tesco website and buy some of these foods um, and they would actually receive them as well. So it was a real choice. Um, but it seemed the, the, the behavior shifted, but the preference didn't. So it, um, to me, that suggests there might be something motivational happening in the sense that you might not like fruit anymore after being presented with one of these primes, but your motivation to eat it, despite not particularly liking it, but presumably knowing it's thought to be good for you, right. um, is, is potentially being shifted. Now, I'm saying that very tentatively based on some, some data that a student of mine collected that I haven't actually been able to analyze because she lost some of that data, unfortunately. Um, and I'm gonna have to run more studies on that. Um, but I think you raise a really good question. I think we need to start to look at what is that shift. Um, I've also hypothesized in some of my work that it might be a time horizon shift. Um, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily going to be the mechanism underlying the food choice. It might just be a thing that accompanies it. Um, and again, 
it's all up for grabs. One of the things I love about this area of research is there are so many questions and so, so few people actually looking at this particular question from this perspective. And I think this is again why I think the evolutionary perspective is really valuable. Um, and I'm not sure if I can really answer your second question either about the uh, accuracy of risk. And I think one of the problems is, is because actually it's really, really difficult to get objective measures of risk, particularly when we're talking about how uh, people's behavior affects that risk. So the closest thing I've found, and I'm, I'm taking a look at maybe using this data in a secondary analysis now, is some data by uh, the Global Burden of Disease Project, which is a huge collaborative project, where um, people have actually uh, identified the extent to which causes of mortality um, can be uh, accounted for by types of risk which are attributable to behavior. And they've done lots of regression models and absolutely just phenomenal work has gone behind it. It's a huge, very big, very expensive collaborative project that has done this work. But they're starting to get closer to this sort of a methodology which might be able to indicate the extent to which someone's behavior can impact their risk. But that's on an on a aggregate level, you know, societal level. It's not on an individual level. And the very point of the stuff I've been talking about is the fact that actually there might be quite big individual differences with things like socioeconomic status in terms of how much control someone has as an individual. And that, that's really hard to pin down. So life's work potentially. Yeah. Okay, and, okay. and perhaps a final question from Annie Swanepoel, who, who's asked uh, what your thoughts are on the climate anxiety that youth struggle with, as many think they won't grow old. So a very contemporary question. That is, and that's a really fantastic question. And it's something that I want to think about. So um, I mentioned the Global Burden of Disease Project data, and part of the reason I mentioned that is that some of those data are about environmental risks, um, some of which are risks due to climate change uh, that people face um, and the effects that those might actually have on, on things like mortality risk. Um, I think it, it's actually something that makes me very sad because the climate issue is something that no individual really feels they can tackle. Um, I don't know if any of you are like me, I'm actually quite concerned about climate change. I, do my best to be environmentally friendly, but at the end of the day, I feel that I alone can't really do very much. And so this is the ultimate really in sort of uh, <laughs> perceptions of lack of control, really. Um, you, you tend to feel that no matter what you do, there will always be, you know, the shell corporation ruining it for everyone. So um, I think it's a really, it's a big issue and it could be uh, psychologically impacting uh, quite a lot of people and particularly young people. I've noticed my students are actually very, very attuned to these issues as a generation. 